Eric Rudnick, are you ready to rock and roll? Where are you? You're over here. Our first presentation today is choreographing the ballet of CPR with the maestro Dr. Herr Eric Rudnick. My friend Dr. Rudnick here, he and I have been co conspirators Welcome to NorCal EMS Karaoke Morning. If anybody doesn't know Dr. Rudnick, uh, come up and, and shake his hand sometime during the course of the day. He is your medical director for the NorCal EMS region and for Santa Clara County and for AST's paramedic program and for Shasta College and for Parents Without Partners and for those in the support group for people who've been injured by trapezes in the bedroom, all these kinds of things. Emergency physician, disaster medical guru, medical director, my friend, Dr. Eric Rudnick. You're way too kind, Larry. Do I have to be uh, You can say it, Eric. It's okay. So, a couple of things. First, I want to thank everybody here. Um, Everybody who does EMS, whether you're paid or volunteer, are heroes, in my opinion. Um, I was reminded that you all pay it forward every time you go to help patients. Um, I had the opportunity this morning, somebody paid me for it. I was in line at Starbucks, and they paid for my tea. That was very, very nice. And it really got me thinking that all you uh, providers do that every day. And it's an honor or privilege to be your medical director and help. Um, a couple of big shout outs. One to Bill Bogenreef, who's behind the scenes. Yeah, Bill is our IT person at NorCal, and without him, we wouldn't be uh, where we're at. Another big shout out to say thank you to Kathy Van Dong. Stand up, Kathy. Say hi, Kathy. Okay. Um, another big shout out to Larry Masterman, who uh, likes to embarrass me whenever humanly possible. And another thank you to our sponsors and our vendors. Without them, this conference would not take place. So we're going to go through some of the science, because good high quality CPR is a ballet. Uh, this is coming from a former dance studio owner. No, I don't dance. No, my wife doesn't dance. But I will tell you the story at break if you come and find me. Um, both my daughters dance, but I have three left feet. So who here knows CPR? Raise your hand. Your heroes. You are the backbone of resuscitating cardiac arrest patients in the world. Uh, because without high quality CPR, uh, sorry, ALS providers, it doesn't matter. If you don't do good CPR, the rest just really doesn't matter. Okay, see if I can figure out how to make this work. Okay, I am challenged. Technical difficulties. Oops. Well, while they're getting this sorted out, I can give the presentation without the slides. So I'm going to prove to you that CPR is where it's at. Because if you follow the resuscitation literature, which I do pretty extensively, uh, more and more it's where the rubber hits the road. It's good CPR, because without good CPR, patients don't survive. It's really about getting good blood flow to the brain, good blood flow to the heart. After that, it's all great. 
do this with. Okay. So the, the providers are getting younger every. Maybe, maybe not. Hopefully, <laughs> when we demonstrate that the CPR providers and people who learn CPR are getting younger and younger every day. Okay. Okay, we're good to go. Yay. Okay. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, here we go. She understands that CPR is where it's at. I think that was 30 to 2, I don't know. Live, damn it, live. So, I just couldn't resist. So, this is what my dog practices in the evenings with me. Um, he's just planning ahead. So my vision, and yes, I do have visions, uh, OOHCA is out of hospital cardiac arrest. It's a moral imperative for all of us. Because I think if we do CPR and resuscitation well, then everything else will fall into place for us. So the goal of this lecture is to show that high quality CPR again is not complex, but it's hard work. I had the uh, privilege to attend a resuscitation academy, and I was down practicing my CPR. CPR is a young person's sport, just to let you know. And I'm going to convince you that BLS rules or rocks and ACLS drools. Yes, I said drools. So here are the references. Um, there are lots of different programs out there. Take Heart America. The CARES Registry, which is a huge national database. I have the privilege of working in Santa Clara County. Two of our sister counties, Alameda and Contra Costa, have a lot of these programs already in place. So what's the scope of our problem? Well, in 2013, there were 360,000 or so uh, out of hospital cardiac arrests. The overall survival rate, if you take all rhythms, is unfortunately pretty abysmal, 9.5%. Granted, it's probably better than when I trained when the earth was still cooling, uh, but it's still abysmal. And when we talk about survival, I mean people who walk out of the hospital, who are walking and talking, who have what's known as a CPC score, or cerebral performance score of one or two. Now, a, a cerebral performance score of one would be Mr. Jason Swan in the back, who's uh, gesturing wildly right now. He's normal, or as normal as an EMS provider gets. Alert, a CPC score of two, you're a little cognitively impaired, kind of like me. Uh, we're gonna focus on VF and VT. And you don't need to know it, as long as the AED that you're putting on the patient knows it because that's where we can really make a huge impact. So what's cardiac arrest? You're dead. So in training, I was told you can only help somebody who's dead, you can't hurt them, and that's pretty true. If we don't really start CPR and get the resuscitation going within about 10 minutes, then you go to irreversible biologic death. Your cells are toast. There are systems in this country whose survival rates from VF, ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, are 50% or better with a CPC score of one or two. Seattle, Minneapolis, Houston. I'm going to start, this is the first kickoff of an initiative that I have 
uh, for the next three to five years, we're going to truly change the way we do CPR and resuscitation. So this is a tough slide to see. This is from the CARES registry. So this is five years worth of data, and they had 31,000 patients. And we're really talking about witnessed arrest, because that's who has the best shot. So we need to start getting more hands-only, chest compression-only CPR, because if you look at the literature, if you initially go down, you don't need ventilations. Again, initial VFVT. The bottom line, though, is here. Out of 32,000, about 2,000 made it to the hospital. Discharged live, 50% of those people who got admitted to the hospital, to, admitted to the ICU, and they had a CPC score of one or two, 1,000. So basically, if you went home from this database, you were a walkie-talkie person. Very different than when I, went to when I did training. The chain of survival. Again, if for every minute that passes that CPR isn't done, the chances of survival falls about 7 to 10 percent. So that's why after about 10 minutes, the chances of anybody really surviving is very poor. When they look at studies in casinos, we're all videotaped right now. And so most of the security guards in many casinos all trained, they have AEDs, they know CPR. So you can watch the choreography of the resuscitation. The purpose, again, of CPR is to deliver blood to the heart and the brain. After that, it's all gravy. We'll talk briefly about the three model phase and why CPR is so important and why immediate electricity is so important. The first phase is the electrical phase, hence why we need AEDs everywhere. Uh, the Emergency Medical Directors Association of California I happen to be the secretary, is working to try to change things. If you're in a gym and you want to get an AED, you need a doctor's prescription. I think that's silly. I think it's counterproductive. You can go to Costco and buy an AED. So, zero to four minutes, you need to buzz them. You get them back quickly. Next, you go to the circulatory phase. That's where CPR comes into play. What happens is as the heart muscle continues to fibrillate, it loses energy, ATP. You need blood, you need oxygen, you need glucose. So the CPR replenishes that. And next is the metabolic phase. This is where the science is still in its infancy. This is where things like therapeutic hypothermia may play a role. Now, I've been questioned <clears throat> excuse me, several times about why we don't have therapeutic hyperthermia in NorCal. Uh, initially, five, six years, ten years ago, it was all the rage. If you're starting to look at the new studies, it may not be the actual hypothermia, but it's the absence of fever. And there was a big study that came out last month in the New England Journal of Medicine showing there were no differences in the pediatric population with therapeutic hyperthermia versus not. Unfortunately, the final common pathway is asystole, flat line. So again, oxygen in the heart, adequate energy, your pH is still normal, and your heart muscle is not ischemic, meaning no blood flow. <coughs> and hopefully, excuse me, there's no uh, heart attack or myocardial infarction. And again, electricity is where it's at. This is simply showing what I talked to you about earlier. For every minute, the survival goes down 7 to 10 percent. Again, early defibrillation with an AED or a monitor is key. So it's really CPR and AEDs that save lives and all BLS providers. So briefly, the circulatory phase inadequate oxygen, inadequate energy, acidosis, meaning you're got the pH uh, getting lower and lower and therefore your tissues don't like it and they die. You probably have ischemic or lack of blood flow to your heart and you can defibrillate these patients till the cows come home but the chances of converting them is very low. 
and then we'll, again, circulatory phase, chest compressions may work, they may not. Later on, the heart just doesn't like it. Again, you're start trying to restock energy. Again, initial chest compressions. You know, if you look at the Arizona experience, they did this on a statewide level. Pretty amazing stuff. They started with circulation and hands-only CPR training. They took their survival rate statewide from about 18%, it's over 40% now. And the 40% I'm talking about are those patients with VF or VT who can be electrically shocked. 40%, amazing. This is a quick study by Paradis. And there's something called cerebral perfusion pressure or coronary perfusion pressure, both abbreviated CPP. The bottom line with this graph is you need blood going to your heart and you need blood going to your brain. 15%, the pressure at zero, nobody survived. <clears throat> Excuse me. At 15 to 20% pressure, 46 survived. And then greater than 25, and normal is probably around 80, but greater than 25 with CPR, almost uh, a little better than two-thirds survived. Now, these patients may not have gone home because they were critically ill and had multiple different things wrong with them, but they were initially able to be resuscitated. <sighs> same graph, same type of data. Again, people survive 24 hours with a higher cerebral perfusion, coronary perfusion pressure. It's all about getting blood to your heart muscle. This is V-fib. It's very coarse, kind of undulating. The monitor, AED, will see this and say, shock advised. Life is good, relatively speaking. After five minutes with no perfusion, no blood flow, it's not as coarse, there's no beat to beat variability. This is the same waveform, again, looking like the original waveform after five minutes of CPR. So there's that, no blood, blood again. This can be shocked. That's why CPR is so important. Who here thinks they do good quality CPR, high quality CPR? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. This is not. Who here thinks they could improve their CPR? Very good. Um, I think you're all right. I think we think we do good CPR. I think that there are little things called pauses. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold. That we all have when doing CPR, and it's a choreography. I think we can skip over this. This just is reinforcing what we just talked about. So it's the owl experience. Immediate defibrillation, 24% survived. 90 seconds, minute and a half of CPR, 30% survived. The subgroup analysis, the immediate defibrillation was superior to 90, <clears throat> was superior to 90 seconds of CPR for the first three minutes only. Again, the electrical phase, zero to four minutes. We can skip the Oslo experience. So, chest compressions, the rate. Who here knows the song, Staying Alive? Yes, I'm old. If you can think of the song, Staying Alive, that's the perfect rate. Who here uses a metronome during CPR? My challenge to you is to go to a company like Lifetimer, and no, I don't have stock in Lifetimer, L-Y-F-E-T-Y-M-E-R, 695, it's a little light that blinks. Every time that light blinks, you do CPR. The rate is so critical. If you look at this study, the number of 30-second segments, the compression rate, the sweet spot, is about 100 to 120, and this is survival. And it just, it's a, it just goes up, it peaks, and then it starts going down. Because if you do it too fast, then the heart muscles doesn't have time to refill. The, the coronary arteries don't get any blood. Here's the same type of graph, chest compressions. ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. Basically, the, we reanimate the person. 
again, 30 second segments, no ROSC, ROSC. Again, the peak is around 100 to 120. 90% get ROSC. Pretty amazing stuff. That's why the American Heart says 100 to 120. So, the depth. We all got trained two inches versus 1.5 inches. So, CPR duration here, survival. If you look at the depth, you can see the difference. Two inches is, is superior to 1.5. Shock success. If you look at, by, again, by the depth, compression depth, one and a half to two inches, 93%. This is a very small number, so I'm not sure why it even goes up from 93 to 100%. So, we can skip that. Am I going backwards? Yes, I am. Shame on me. There we go. No, now I am going. I am technically challenged today. So, bottom line is you need defibrillation early. If you don't get them by about four minutes, you need CPR beforehand. It should be very interesting to see what happens this October when the American Heart puts out their new guidelines. The other thing that I thought was fascinating is the American Heart's not only going to do every five years, they're going to probably do every one to two years with smaller updates. And you can go online and actually make comments on whether you think it's good science or it makes sense or not from a pre-hospital provider standpoint. So in the metabolic phase, again, poor survival. Okay, let's keep going. It's too much on the metabolic phase is depressing because we really just don't know enough of the science in the metabolic phase. So this is me trying to do CPR. Yes, I am dyslexic. So what does this all really mean? The bottom line is if you get to a person less than four minutes and they've been in cardiac arrest, you, so these people survive. Four to 10 minutes, they need CPR. Greater than 10 minutes, unfortunately, they usually don't survive. Unknown, they may have been uh, just hypotensive and then you finally did go into cardiac arrest. So how does CPR work? Well, there's a couple of different theories. There's the pump theory and there's the uh, thoracic pump theory. Who here thinks that the blood goes forward because you're pressing on the sternum, squeezes the heart, and it squeezes all the blood out? Raise your hand. God, you're a good audience. You're right. What happens is you increase the pressure inside your chest, and it inadvertently will push the blood forward. Then, with chest recoil, and you need to get off the chest, you don't need to surf it is you create a negative pressure inside your chest, sucks the blood in. So the other thing too is, this is an amazing study. We hyperventilate our patients to death. Who here thinks that you do good BVM as far as rate goes when you're doing a resuscitation? This study by Oftaheide showed people were polled, I didn't put the whole study in, but they thought they were doing 10 to 12 compression uh, ventilations per minute. Well, the first group was about 37. That's kind of a oopsie. Then they trained them, and it did drop, but it dropped only to 22. What you need to do is what I needed to do is you need to take my pulse first. And you need to take a big, deep breath. You can only help people and slow down the ventilations strong and steady CPR. This, if you understand this slide, everything about CPR makes 100% sense. So, this side here is millimeters of mercury pressure. This is coronary perfusion pressures. This is cerebral perfusion pressure. So, this line here and this line here is how much blood is getting to your heart. So every time the heart gets pressed, the pressure increases, blood goes out to the aorta from the coronary arteries that come off the aorta, it goes to the heart muscle. This 
is the blood that goes up your brain. So these are brakes, and what happens here? Well, the compressors change, because you can't do more than probably two to four minutes of CPR. I know I can't. And what happens is the coronary perfusion pressure goes down, 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 down. This happens within three seconds. Here, another pump, and it starts going down. It takes a while, probably about 15 seconds, to rebuild to 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury. So every time somebody takes you know, a monitor and says, okay, I want to check the rhythm, the coronary perfusion pressure and the pressure to your brain goes away. So those are called perishock pauses. We need to minimize that. And that's why this is choreography. We'll be introducing, hopefully, in NorCal, the crew resource management or the pit crew approach to CPR. And um, when you clear, Mr. Mastin, come here. Thank you, Bill, because I know you all are going to pick on you. So when you got trained to do CPR, how, when, you, when I would say clear, how would you clear from the patient? Put you, right. Exactly. Um, that's the way I got trained. Well, that's wrong. Thank you, Bill, for demonstrating. There'll be a check in the mail for you later. What you need to do is your hands need to be about a half inch, half inch off the chest. So when that person says, when the machine says shock advised, you push the button, you tap the top of the hand, they go right back to CPR. You know, somebody said, well, what about the electricity that's going through there? It's going to jump out. No. Mr. Bogenreef, who is a master of everything, he is a true renaissance man, and I were discussing this. Well, evidently, it takes about 20,000 volts to jump about a half inch. Average AED doesn't deliver more than maybe several thousand volts, and the maximum voltage is about 10,000. So, if you've got gloves on, and you're a half inch, that's wonderful, because how many seconds do you think you save from the when I got trained, clear, and back again. Five seconds. You say, oh, what's five seconds? Well, if you look at this graph, that's a coronary perfusion pressure. Your heart muscle goes from saying, yes, life is good. I've got oxygen. I've got blood. I've got glucose. I've got energy. And then suddenly, I'm joking. Give me blood, please. So seconds do count. That's why this is a choreography. I got trained, and, and I admit, I didn't know high-quality CPR. And the people who were training me were not other docs. They were paramedics. They were got the big picture. So here's what happens in continuous. Continuous cerebral perfusion pressures, continuous coronary perfusion pressures. That's why chest compression only CPR works so well. Because when you first go down, you probably have five to seven minutes of oxygen in uh, your system. The other thing that people are talking about, and you'll hear more about this potentially in October, is there's something called passive diffusion. And you'll hear about people putting nasal cannulas on patients, cranking it up to 15 liters per minute, and that's it. No ventilations, yet passively they get oxygen. So, again, if you look at this graph, this is CPR resuscitation prior to fibrillation with V-fib. If they defib first, 90 seconds of CPR, then defib. 6% increase. Let's get that. So, pre-shock pauses. It's a linear relationship. Less than 10 seconds of pre-shock pauses, 90% got resuscitated. 30 seconds. And for the ALS providers, if you look at the monitors, the, all the stuff is recorded, and you go through it. The other thing that we're going to be looking at is dispatch. So, so what does this all really mean? For an EMS provider, less than four minutes after collapse, what do you need to do? You buzz them. Bystander CPR at this point 
is not as important. We tell lay people to do it and providers to do it because most times these aren't witnessed. So, greater than four minutes, less than 10, CPR, then you defibrillate them. And CPR, good high quality, can't be stressed. After 10 minutes with the uh, metabolic phase, we don't know. So cardiac care is a continuum. We have dispatch, bystander, school. We're working really to change the state laws. High quality CPR. I really hope that American Heart really starts teaching better quality CPR. I wanted, I'm looking for a grant to get high quality mannequins. They're about 2,500 bucks with a $50 um, screen that will show you exactly how hard to push, how fast to go, and how much recoil. Because um, you're building muscle memory. We've talked a little bit about Cree resource management. We already have amiodarone. Talking about the impedance threshold device, the rescue pod is probably beyond the scope of this lecture. Mechanical devices like the Lucas or the Autopulse are good. Um, we talked at the last medical advisory committee meeting about the link trial and really showed non-inferiority. I look at the mechanical devices as safety devices because I challenge anybody, ALS, BLS, to do high quality CPR in the back of a moving ambulance. I don't think it can be done. I think it's dangerous for providers. I think you're doing yourself and the patient a, a uh, disservice. And one of the things I'm considering doing within the next several years is going from a load and go to stay and play in NorCal. Because if you really look at the outcomes, the difference is made at scene. With amiodarone, high quality CPR, um, and BLS airways are just as good as an ALS airway initially for resuscitation. Yes, I'm sorry. I like to intubate just as much as the next person. There are several questions. You know, there's a big raging controversy about should we be intubating or not in the field? And we're not asking the right question. I heard an excellent lecture by Dr. Spade from the University of Arizona. There's lots of literature out there, particularly by Henry Wang, who's in the University of Alabama, saying pre-hospital intubation is terrible. We're killing our patients. Well, it's probably not that it's the act of intubating, but it's the act of hyperventilation. And that's its own lecture in and of itself. The other thing that you, you may see and read is thing, something called ECMO. And we talked a lot about that in January. It's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Fancy way of saying bypass. So these prolonged V-fib and V-tac patients who you just can't convert are being put on cardiac bypass in the ER. Um, pretty high tech stuff. And you can leave them on it for days. It was first pioneered many years ago for uh, neonatal patients. The other thing, if you look at the Arizona experience, is PCR, percutaneous coronary intervention. These are the patients who get caught uh, get ROS back, return of spontaneous circulation. Arizona is taking all these patients to cath and finding a huge number of patients who can be saved. That's not common practice yet. So the choreography, again, BLS rules, ACLS rules, the correct hand position, proper rate, I think I've demonstrated with resuscitation why that's so important, depth of compression, full recoil, you need to not surf on their chest. Ventilations of one second. Minimal pauses. No pauses greater than nine to 10 seconds. I would say five seconds. Okay, intubation and IV access. As we go through this cardiac initiative, I'll be recommending you go straight to IO. The landmarks never change, ever. Why try, I mean, if you can get an IV quickly, more power to you. But if you're spending more than 60, 90 seconds trying to get an IV, take out the Makita drill and just do it. If you're a BLS provider, again, initially it's not as important. If you look at Seattle, when their medic crews get on before the fire department, before their BLS crews, you know what the medic crews do? BLS, no ALS. 
People say, well, you can't intubate during CPR. Horse pucky. You can. People do it. Video laryngoscopy is a great toy. What happens when your batteries die? So NASCAR, everybody loves NASCAR. They have the right approach. Everybody knows their job. It's done efficiently, and it's a ballet if you ever watch NASCAR. We want to be in the winner's circle, so we don't want to be here. So here's a huge study, and the bottom line is there was no advantage to epinephrine. What happens with epinephrine, and it's still part of ACLS, is if you give a young heart or a middle-aged heart or even an old heart like mine, enough epinephrine, you can reanimate a brick. You can get a brick pumping. The problem is you get the heart going again, but there's nothing left up here. We don't know enough about cerebral resuscitation yet. That's the sad part. So this was in my backyard. This is a clue that she is gone. I'll take any questions or issues, comments, concerns. Oh, come on, you have to have at least a question or two. I know this wasn't rocket science, but this is really the science behind why CPR rocks. Um, you could call me a man on a mission. Okay, well, I either put you all to sleep, or you're all, no, you're all asleep, never mind. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good morning. Well, I have a question. Oh. Ask the question. I'm, yes, I'm old. Yes, I'm gray. Yes, I'm decrepit. Um, I forgot. I'm supposed to do something else. So, silly me. We're changing the format a little bit. Go on, Mr. Masterman. You said you had the question. Yes. Are we bringing back intracardiac injections in the field anytime soon? When donkeys fly. <laughs> Another one for the old guard. Who remembers when the epinephrine and the calcium chloride came in a five and a half inch intracardiac needle in the ambulance? Yeah. It's exciting, but it doesn't do anything. It was a great deterrent when you had that belligerent drunk that insisted on transport. And you said, okay, well, we're just going to stick this in a, a hand vein and give you a little injection to make the, the ride smoother. All of a sudden, they didn't need to go so bad. Yeah. Don't oh, thank you. What did you forget? What I forgot is we're going to take out your um, tests and we're going to go new format this year. We're going to go over the test questions and everybody gets to play. So, question one. There is no difference between high quality CPR and traditional CPR. True or false? Thank you very much. That is at an educational preview of something you need to get a CE credit for. So CPR should not be the first priority in non-witness cardiac arrest. That's false. Um, if we don't know, two minutes of CPR is good. Okay, next. You should be able to defibrillate a patient out of VF, ventricular arrest, in the electrical phase of cardiac arrest. That's zero to four minutes. True. Next, therapeutic hyperthermia may be a value to the resuscitated cardiac arrest patient in the metabolic phase, that's after 10 minutes. It may be, um, I would say true. The optimal rate for chest compression, I wrote the test, I know. So the original, the optimal rate for chest compressions is between 100 and 120 minutes, 120 beats per minute. Oh, it's been a long morning. I've been up since 4.30. It's true. So as an aside, if you're singing um, Staying Alive, that's great. But there's another song by Queen whose rate is the right rate, but it really doesn't do good things to your customer satisfaction scores. And that's another one bites the dust. So there we go. False, false. 
True, 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 true. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you for putting up with me.